Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, a new armoured dinosaur species has been discovered, skeletal remains in Pompeii have been reanalyzed with surprising results, and a paper discusses whether dinosaurs were actually too big to walk. Spoilers! they were definitely able to walk. Before we get into the news, be sure that you're subscribed to the new home of 7 Days of Science. We'll only be uploading these episodes to this channel for another two or three weeks, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss future episodes. Also, if you go over to the new channel now, you'll find an extended version of this episode that includes a few extra stories, so be sure to watch that. This episode has been brought to you by Curiosity Box, also known as probably the greatest Christmas present you could receive or give as a scientist lover, as a science lover. Yeah! To see Ben, Doug and myself excitedly unboxing the autumn box, check out our video on when arachnids ruled the earth. It's yeah. the body jacket! The body. <laughs> it's the one I wanted! It's, <laughs> it's so cool! Do you want to come over there? Like, so Starting off the news this week, a study re-evaluating the data gathered by Voyager 2 of one of the most distant planets in our solar system, Uranus. A lot of our data from our most distant planetary companions comes from the flypasts of humanity's most distant explorers, the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 spacecrafts. When Voyager 2 passed Uranus in 1986, it revealed a very strange set of data about the magnetic field of the planet. This was quite the shock, as was the intense electron radiation belt and the severely plasma-depleted magnetosphere. This led to several other assumptions about the icy planet, including the saddening conclusion that life would not be able to be present in these incredibly extreme conditions. Well, this study says that may not be the case. Voyager 2's passing happened at quite an unlucky time. If it had passed just five days earlier, its readings would have been very different. This flyby happened during a time when Uranus was experiencing some of the more intense powers of the Sun during an unusually powerful solar storm. This means that the extreme conditions observed by Voyager 2 wouldn't usually be present on Uranus. Or rather crucially, the moons that were inside this seemingly cataclysmic field of influence. This will massively impact any future studies on Uranus, but we have good news if you're worried about a sudden absence of data. In 2045, NASA's Uranus orbiter and probe will hopefully arrive at the planet and collect a host of new new and exciting data that could well transform what we know about one of the most mysterious planets in our solar system, Uranus. First up in the paleontology news, we welcome a new species of ankylosaur. It's been found in southern China in rocks dating to the late Cretaceous between about 84 and 72 million years ago. The name of this new species is Huaxia Zhaolong Shaowen. I'm so sorry if I've butchered that. And it's known from a pretty well-preserved partial skeleton that only really lacks the head, neck and a few other bits. Bits and bobs. This was quite a large ankylosaur at an estimated six meters in total length and is preserved with a complete tail club that looks like it would have inflicted some serious damage when swung. Various anatomical features are pointed out by the paleontologists as proving this is a distinct species from other ankylosaurs found from similar times and places, such as the species Datai Ying Liangsis. That's not bad. Which is also from southern China and was named earlier this year. Huaxa Zulong is found to be a basal or primitive member of the family Ankylosauridae, adding to scientists' understanding of the evolution of this lineage of amazing dinosaurs. Also this week, an official published response has been made to the infamous book Too Big to Walk an attempt to show that all dinosaurs were in fact too large to have lived on land and therefore were all aquatic. The author of this book, Brian J. Ford, has also pushed forward this hypothesis in various magazine articles, radio interviews and talks, despite the fact that there's a lot of evidence to the contrary. It also seems he missed the fact that this very idea that large dinosaurs would have had to be supported by bodies of water had already been proposed back in the 20th century and has since been tested and rejected. 
Anyway, in this published response, paleontologist Dr. Darren Nash goes through the various arguments and points out all the evidence supporting terrestrial capabilities in the vast majority of dinosaur lineages. Spinosaurus is, of course, a whole other thing. In short, the too big to walk hypothesis just doesn't hold water. <laughs> I see what you did there, Ben. I mean, this is a hypothesis that quite seriously suggests the reason the non-bird dinosaurs went extinct is because all the giant dinosaurs had to reproduce in so-called sex lakes. And eventually these dried up so they could no longer mate and so they all died. I am serious. <laughs> This idea has even spawned a browser game to mock it called Lemmy Splash, <laughs> in which you have to fling the dinosaurs into a sex lake. Wow. Nobody can claim paleontologists don't have a sense of humour. Anyway, Dr. Nasha's published article is a great explanation of why this hypothesis really doesn't work and does a brilliant job of going through all the modern science that shows most dinosaurs were terrestrial. Sex lakes. <laughs> oh God, they must have been salty. First up in the archeology span news, a recent study has discovered the oldest known evidence for intensive ochre mining, at least 48,000 years old in Lion Cavern in Eswatini, Africa. Ochre is a very pigmented earth mineral in colors such as red, yellow, or violet, often conflated with manganese oxide, which is black ochre. Its importance throughout human history is indisputable. Homo sapiens and indeed other hominins have been using this pigmented earth mineral for at least 500,000 years, possibly even longer. Ochre is often said to be the earliest known pigment used by humans to depict our world around them. The differences between ochres are not always obvious and pigments that appear to be the same color and texture often are distinct physiochemically. The researchers used 173 samples from 15 Stone Age sites to reconstruct the regional network of ochre mining, transportation, and usage. Their work demonstrates there were local strategies for procuring ochre, but also long distance transportation via a wider network. The data supports the assumption that hunter-gatherers were very mobile in Eswatini during the Stone Age and sometimes traveled long distances to transport ochre pigments. The team also used optically stimulated luminescence dating to confirm the Lion Cavern is the oldest known evidence of intensive ochre mining in the world. And lastly on the archaeology news for the week, a new study using DNA evidence has rewritten the story of people buried in the Pompeii eruption. After Mount Vesuvius' famous 79 AD eruption, the skeletons of the unfortunate inhabitants of the city remained well preserved in the ash. The researchers of the study extracted DNA from the skeletons inside the casts to more accurately determine genetic relationships relationships, sex, and trace ancestry. Interestingly, their findings largely contradicted previous assumptions based solely on physical appearance and the positioning of the casts. The findings pick apart the modern lens used to interpret these ancient cultures, such as the use of jewelry to indicate femininity or the interpretation of close proximity as evidence of blood relationships. For example, in the House of the Golden Bracelet, the only site where we have genetic information from multiple individuals, the four people that were originally thought to be the two parents and their children actually have no genetic ties to one another. One important example at this site is the discovery that an adult wearing a golden bracelet and holding a child, formerly interpreted as mother and child, were an unrelated adult male and child. Similarly, a pair of individuals thought to be sisters or mother and daughter were found to include at least one genetic male. These fascinating findings has given us yet another incredible insight into the Roman Empire from Pompeii and serves as another warning not to assume modern values when analysing ancient cultures. In addition, the DNA analyse shows that these particular individuals were descended from immigrants from the Eastern Mediterranean, another reminder of the cosmopolitan nature of even the heartland of the Roman Empire. In the latest conservation news, recent research has investigated some of the worrying effects of avian flu on marine mammals. 2020 saw the emergence of the H5N1 strain of avian flu, 
It is highly pathogenic and has caused numerous outbreaks in wild birds around the world. It also has been found in mammals. It was thought that it was limited to terrestrial carnivores that consumed infected birds or interacted with them in other ways. However, a recently published study has shown evidence of mammal to mammal transmission. In addition to monitoring outbreaks, the spread of the virus can be traced using genomic analysis. It was found to spread along the coast of Peru and Chile from 2022 to 2023. More than 30,000 sea lions died as a result of the virus moving southwards towards Tierra del Fuego Island at the tip of South America. By August 2023, the outbreak had moved northwards to Argentina along the Atlantic coast. Here, an elephant seal colony was infected and it was thought that it was spread to the elephant seals by the sea lions. The outbreak killed more than 17,000 elephant seals, including about 97% of their pups. And it is estimated that this year, only about a third of the elephant seals normally expected in this area here have returned. The virus was also found to have split over back into a tern colony. The scientists are concerned that the H5N1 viruses are becoming more evolutionarily flexible. They now have mutations that enable them to infect mammals, which could have global consequences for wildlife, humans and livestock. This week, we have a special guest who is going to tell us about a new contribution coming to Sevendos. It's Ben's dad! Hello viewers, it's a real honour to be here. So, Ben's dad, tell us a bit about yourself and what we, what will you be doing for Seven Dos? Uh, well, a long time ago, I did a degree in physics and then I worked as a remote sensing scientist for a bit and then I became a high school teacher for nearly 30 years. Oh. Uh, and now I'm a science outreach and engagement professional at a university, uh, which is a really cool job and I really love it when more ordinary people get involved in doing science. So I'm going to contribute a regular feature to SEMDOS where I try out and review one of the hundreds of citizen science projects out, out there so that some of the seven days of science viewers can get involved in some science themselves. Okay, but before you tell us more about that, I really need to ask you some questions about Ben and Doug. Obviously you're Ben's dad, but I think you were also Doug's physics teacher, weren't you? Yes, that's right. I think a lot of people would like to know what it was like being responsible for bringing Ben up. Yeah, well, it was tough. Uh, there was all the feeding and the ordinary stuff, like the pushing food into his mouth like a baby bird, um, and then the poo came out the other end and sometimes vomit. That was fine. But then the dinosaur obsession started, the big words, the constant shame he made you feel when you called something a dinosaur, and it wasn't, it was all very stressful. Like a Pterosaur, yeah. And then we had to find a dinosaur obsession specialist, a Professor Martel, who took him into care and was able to talk to him constantly about dinosaurs. My heart goes out to you and your family. That sounds like a really terrible, terrible time. Would you like a tissue? I think I will need one, actually. Does anyone actually have tissues? No, I'll be all right. Okay, okay. Let's change the subject to Doug then. Really? Do we have to? What was it like teaching Doug? Well, I don't really like to think about it too much. I just remember the constant stare, mm. questioning the eyes boring into my skull, never really believing anything that I said. I only lasted for one term and then I had to leave and find another job at another school. I understand. He does have a very aggressive stare. Would you like another tissue? Well, if you had one, I would, but I think I, think I can carry yeah, on. I, yeah. I don't know why I asked. We don't have any tissues. Okay, so let's move on. Tell us about the first citizen science projects you have to review and how seven DOS viewers can get involved. Yeah, I've chosen a project called Iguanas from Above from the Zooniverse platform, which is a fantastic site with hundreds of projects to choose from. I chose this one as the first because iguanas do look a bit like dinosaurs, whatever Ben says, and because the project has a really important environmental aim. What do you have to do to take part? Well, first of all, you sign up to the project from the link in the description at the end of this video. Um, and the project scientists need you to scan images taken from drones to spot marine iguanas in the Galapagos Islands, as well as other animals you might see, plants, algae, artificial debris such as plastics and fishing gear. 
Uh, there's a section to show you what to do, plenty of help options and a discussion forum where you can ask other project members questions. Sounds fantastic. And why is this a useful thing to do? Why do we want people to do it? Well, drones help scientists to monitor the health of the marine iguana population very rapidly and with minimal disturbance. But this generates too many images for one scientist to check. So that's why the help of thousands of citizen scientists is really important. And it helps with monitoring other organisms in the local ecosystem and with assessing the amount of plastic debris being washed up in the islands. So I'm assuming you've tried this project. I did. And what did you think? Well, I think I would give this one uh, four out of five stars on a review. Um, it was really fun looking for iguanas and it was quite addictive. Oh. Uh, really exciting when you did find uh, a marine iguana or one of the other Galapagos um, animals. There are a lot of red crabs. Uh, the only thing that I would criticise is the zoom functions. When you zoom in to try and identify something, it gets a bit, bit grainy. Ah, fair enough. Thank you, Ben's dad. It has been great talking to you and we're looking forward to more citizen science reviews on 7DOS. Sorry for bringing up some of the difficult issues from the past. You know, we don't have to talk about okay, Doug again. Thank you. His stare is really creepy. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Also, in case you've missed the announcements, be sure to subscribe to the new Seven Days of Science channel if you want to keep watching this show. Seven Dos will be moving there in the next few weeks and will no longer be uploaded on this channel. So make sure you're subscribed to the new one to keep up to date. Links will be in the description and also be sure to follow the new Seven Dos Instagram account too. Also be sure to check out the curiosity box and sign up for it using our link and use the code FOSSIL for some great discounts. Okay, see you next week.